uh thank you to india science festival for this opportunity to do ttas under their banner for the next two weeks so let's see how many of you have heard of the word microbes before can can anybody just type yes or no in the chat window yes no yes you've definitely heard of the word micro right you've like heard of microwave micro something else you've heard of the word micro a lot so i'm sure all of you know that micro means something that's very very small okay but exactly how small is very small it's something that's measured in microns now to give you an idea of how small one micron is does everybody know how small one millimeter is? yes all of you have seen this scale you use scales like this for your school work you can you remember how small 1 mm looks on that yes so 1 mm the tiniest thing that you see on that scale that you use is actually equal to 1000 microns okay so imagine dividing that tiny tiny part into 1000 equal parts you cannot even see it with your eyes that's how small microorganisms are or microbes are right and that's why they're called microbes um and because we can't see it with our naked eyes we need a special instrument to see it and that special instrument is called a microscope again micro because you're using it to, to look at things that are microns in size okay so i hope all of you know what microbes are how how tiny they are and why we need something special to look at them sounds great and keep typing your questions we will take them regularly okay so not only are microbes really small but they are also all very different they are so unique they give us lots of reasons to want to study them so you have some microbes that are like these little clusters of grapes okay but all, all micron sized okay like imagine a big cluster but in a micron size some of them look like these little rods and then you have some microns called archaea that survive enormously difficult conditions like high temperature and high pressure and extreme cold and then you have viruses which uh, uh, which infect uh, bacteria and also viruses in general are microbes then you have parasites certain pa parasites and then you have fungi so there's a lot of diversity in microbes and that includes bacteria viruses fungi parasites and protozoa all of them have different sizes and all of them survive under very different conditions and present problems to humans of a very wide range so all good so far everyone yes um, sounds good i yes. can see a few questions yes um how do scientists design microscopes that is another entire field of study uh, there are different kinds of microscopes but basically all of them use different kinds of lenses um different forms of lenses that will help you basically magnify that's what you want to do right you want to see something that's very tiny but you want to magnify it so that it looks bigger and so that we can see it And then Sneha Myra says, "Lonar Crater is home to yes, and Lonar Crater is in Lonar Lake is in Maharashtra, and it's home to several different types of microbes. Okay. Yes, so um, uh, Shivra, microbes are everywhere. We don't see them, and wait to get even more surprised if you're hearing about them for the first time. Okay, Sneha, over to you. Okay, so microbes, like we said, are found absolutely everywhere. There probably isn't a surface that you can touch where there aren't any microbes." okay they're found in the air they're found in water in soil in food and get this even on us so right now as all of you are talking there are millions of microbes on your body just right now if you touch your skin there are tons of microbes but we just can't see them they're even inside us our stomach is home to tons of microbes so what this really tells us is that even though we can't see these creatures they are absolutely everywhere and to the extent that they are on our bodies constantly and we never know but can you imagine that they probably do play an important role right because they are on our bodies all the time and we can't get rid of them no matter what you do right and so they are inhabitants of the earth just like we are it's a parallel microbial universe going on yes. if you can think of it like that okay so let's uh we had a wonderful question that said uh, from uh, from uh, kashika that said all microbes are bad no so we start we head right into fact that there are many microbes that are good and let's talk about them in two different groups two things that matter to us a lot our human body and what we eat i think it's safe to say these two things really do matter to us all right okay okay all right 
so like we said microbes are found everywhere and even on our own body okay so now imagine this if you consider all the microbes that are covering your body that are inside your body and you count all of them you count each microbial cell and then you count each cell of the human body so all of you know that the human body has cells right we have different cells in the brain different cells in our heart different cells in our stomach we have skin cells so if you combine all of our human cells together our body actually has more microbial cells than human cells we are more microbes than we are our cells can you imagine that so if that you think that is fascinating does that exactly. mean we are never alone snehan we are absolutely never alone so remember that every time you think that you are alone and you feel lonely <laughs> you have millions of microbes with you right all the time okay so think about it in the number in terms of number of cells right we have 10 to the power 14 cells so that's one followed by 14 zeros that's how many human cells we have but for microbes we have 10 to the power 14 million microbes can you imagine that's, that that's ridiculously impressive right and they basically we are their home yes. like your home is your home we are their home they live in us and they must be talking to each other like yeah karishma seems a little stressed out today maybe i'll move a little to another niche where it's a little more comfortable just imagine yes. you know you can you can go crazy right snail so thinking of all the things exactly. they could say about us yes <laughs> and microbes are absolutely everywhere in our body not just on our skin inside our organs our stomach absolutely everywhere so this entire collection of all our microbes together is called our microbiome and everybody has their own signature microbiome just like everybody has their own signature fingerprint everybody has their own signature microbiome wonderful all right and what are the factors that influence our microbiome why is microbiome different from aditis or different from shivrans so what do you think are the factors are that would make you you what is unique to you that would also make your microbes unique to you well yeah we could say we are bags of microbes it really how depends on how you want to look at it that's not a very human centric way of looking at it though so what do you think are the factors okay our dna so we have some all some genetic factor we've inherited okay which is okay what else would make you you what we eat what we very eat. good diet environment what we do in our everyday life where do we live do we live next to a factory do we live next to a mill do we live in uh, in an urban area rural area all of these things are going to influence your microbial profile or your microbiome and so even if you just simply look at the skin which is the largest organ in your body covering from you know head to toe every part of your skin will have a different microbial profile from the oily skin on your face to the drier skin on your palms and soles you will see different microbes groups in different areas right so there's huge diversity our lifestyle so uh, aditi's nicely summed it up our lifestyle okay yes and this is true even within our body so if you look at our entire digestive system so we know that the ph in our stomach is different from the ph in other places in our digestive tract right so even things like ph can influence the kind of microorganisms and the number that is present at these different sites so for example in our stomach we have a lower ph so the kind of microorganisms that can survive in this lower ph is much different there are only some that can survive some cannot the availability of oxygen that's another thing that changes based on the tissues and cells and location in our body and again microbes change so even within us it's not one constant microorganism that's present it's constantly changing it's different in different places so we, so really we have a dynamic a... microbe oh, yeah you said it snail it's like a microbial city like we are living exactly. cities they fly from they they move they change you know it's like we are moving across the world across the globe all right and so this is basically uh, sorry the i don't know why the words got a little can you uh, think of all the different body sites with microbes we've given you some examples yes trisha microbes move okay the nose has microbes for sure what else we've given you a few examples what else where else do we use everywhere mouth <laughs> yes yeah yes mouth mouth is true between toes skin yes a head skin hair ears behind the ears eyes teeth wow nails in our body 
Can Definitely. you think of places in our body now? Brain, uh, brain typically is sterile. If microbes enter, it's not a good thing. But let's think of other sites in liver has uh, can be infected with microbes. Lungs do have microbes. Gut. Excellent, guys. So I think Snail, with that, they've understood the basic concept that microbes yes. exist on us and they change and they are in us and on us. Okay. Yes. So why do we have these microbes? Is it good? Is it bad? So actually, these microbes that we have present on our on and in our body are good. These are the good microbes. They do a lot of functions for us. They help us absolutely exist. If we didn't have these microbes, we would not be able to exist. That's how crucial they are to us. One of the most important things they do is they protect us against other bacteria that can cause diseases that are harmful to us. So because these are already present on our body, it's like their home, right? So they will prevent an invasion. So think about it in terms of your own home. You, you protect your room, right? If you have a sibling at home and you don't share a room, you don't want anybody entering your room, right? You don't like sharing your space with anybody. That's exactly what these bacteria do. They don't like sharing space. So when a harmful bacteria tries to infect us, sometimes these bacteria actually protect us. They can secrete toxins and other chemicals that harm the harmful bacteria. So our microbiome is protecting us by competing with the harmful bacteria. Oh, that's impressive. So almost like they're the gatekeepers or like some sentinels in our gut, you know, looking for foreigners, invaders, you're not supposed to be here kind of people, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so they also do something called, I'm, I'm sorry, the slides, I don't know why this has happened, but we, I think the rest of the slides should be fine. They also train our immune system. You know what it means is our immune system has to recognize foreign microbes or harmful microbes. And it's only by recognizing the good microbes that they're able to say, okay, this is how a microbe looks. And this would be the difference between a good and a bad microbe. So it's kind of like training you. It's like when you're in any training. So what kind of training have you undergone in your life? What, what kind of practice have you done to help you for some bigger thing? SEAL, you've done Navy SEAL training, Athansh? That is impressive. Running. Uh, okay. Education, music. music. So if you have wow. a music concert, your parents will probably say, okay, let's practice with family. So you get over the, you know, fear of performing in front of somebody and then we'll do it in big concert hall. So like that. So they practice with the, our own microbes to say, okay, this is how we would react if foreign pathogens had to happen. This is how they'd look. And then when actual pathogens come, they are ready. They're ready to fight the fight. Okay, so everyone gets that. So they're doing lots of good things for us and not having microbes is not a good thing at all, right? So these are called our friendly microbes, which are in our body. Yes. But microbes are also in a very exciting thing other than our body smell. Yes, <laughs> and this is my favorite part, guys. This is the my most favorite part of this session today. We are going to talk about lots of yummy things uh, because microbes are in our food and they actually make our food yummy. Right. So it depends, of course, on the kind of microbes. But when you think about microbes, you think, oh, if there are germs in my food, maybe that's bad. But that's not true for everything. Some microbes are good and they actually help ferment our food. So let's try to understand what this fermentation is. Uh, but before we do that, let's look at a picture. Let's look at the pictures on the previous slide of the food and let's see how many of these can you identify. OK, oh, no. has everybody had yogurt? Yes. Yogurt, curd, dahi, yes. It has microbes. So this is something we see in our houses almost every day. Mm -hmm. You have microbes in curd. What about soy sauce? Yes. Yes, have had soy sauce. Yes. Again, microbes. Bread. Have yes. had bread. <laughs> Right. So see, there are so many things that we see in our daily lives that we don't realize that our mi that microbes are actually doing something good for us. They're helping us make these foods. Right. And then, of course, exotic foods, they are like kombucha tea and kimchi and miso and tempeh and all yes. the kind of stuff we eat when we are traveling and try to find new stuff. Right. OK. Yes. So, uh, yes, Anya, we'll talk about that. Um, so what are these microbes doing in our body? They basically uh, what are these microbes doing in our food? They enable one process and the name of that process is fermentation and what is basically fermentation it's any sugar so can you name a sugar name give a, let's a chemical name of a sugar 
yeah fermentation is breaking sugar yes very glucose. good kavish glucose sucrose fructose whatever the sugar may be dextrose which is molecules of glucose they break it down into a mixture of acids and alcohols and gases and believe it or not it's these acids and alcohols and gases that give the flavor to bread and the flavor to kombucha tea uh, and the texture to idli batter and dosa batter right it's these molecules produced when microbes break down sugar so this chemical reaction large which is most heavily relied on in food making is fermentation okay and it gives us all the yummy color taste texture to our food yes okay so all of you named glucose as a sugar all of you also named fructose so these are different types of sugars and depending on the microorganism or the microbe that is present it can break it down into different kinds of products okay so for example yeast can break down glucose into ethanol and carbon dioxide uh, lactobacilli and streptococcus are bacteria that can break it down into lactic acid ethanol and carbon dioxide and fructose can be broken down into acetate and carbon dioxide and all of this depends on how long it takes what is the temperature of the food and what are the kind of bacteria present okay but one thing that's common in all of these you will see is carbon dioxide that is being formed and this actually is really important in the different foods that these are involved in that this fermentation takes place in and we'll see why soon Uh, and um, Sneha, uh, just to Anirudh had a great question. Um, sorry, uh, Kashika had a great question of how do microbes enter our food? And the answer is right here, presenting fluffy idlis. This is mouth watering, Sneha. I think we need to like plan our dinners or yes. lunch wherever you are located. So if you've been with your mom late in the night in the kitchen, and this is basically trying to say be with your mom late in the night in the kitchen, so she doesn't have to do it on her own. and she's setting up dahi for the next day or she's setting up dosa she like okay tomorrow dinner we'll do dosas usually in dahi we add a culture right you know what we call starter culture that all our aunties and uncles from neighboring houses give us isse acha dahi banta hai so that's a starter culture of the bacterium bifidobacterium or lactobacillus so there we add it in. but in the case of dosa batter and idli batter it's the lentils the urad dal and the other things that already have the microbe so we don't really add anything those microbes are usually leuconostoc and lactobacillus and we ferment it overnight and the next day when you look at it what do you notice when you look at idli batter the next day what do you notice and how can you correlate it to the fermentation process we described yes we are all very hungry neha says bubble bubbles. very good it is thick yes. you also know very good rises and holes very Absolutely. good okay so and ishika is right it's due to co2 excellent look at that sneha look at that i mean our jobs are on the line right now sneha so it's basically the co2 that has caused the batter to rise and the texture and all has changed because of these acids and alcohols that are produced and now your dosa batter is absolutely ready for making dosas so if you look at it under the microscope you actually see the microbes if you ever have a home microscope and put a drop of dosa batter under it with water you'll actually see the microbes and so they've actually grown and produced their compounds and we consume them so it's all healthy these are healthy microbes yes. okay yes and the same thing happens in bread except it's a different organism that does it and it's yeast so yeast is a different kind of microorganism um and when we make breads yeast is generally added on top it's not something that's naturally present you add yeast to your dough you let it sit for a while so this allows the yeast to do its magic of fermentation um and as soon as you put this in the oven what do you notice about bread if if any of you have seen bread being made or you see it in a tv show in movies what happens to bread again it rises right so what happens is when you start cooking this dough that has yeast in it the yeast has produced all of this carbon dioxide and it's gets trapped in the holes within the dough and then the gas because of the gas it starts to rise and that's why you look at bread most bread has tiny tiny holes in it and those holes come from the carbon dioxide that this yeast has produced right sounds fantastic so every time you have a bread you have an amazing sandwich you have fluffy idlis you have to say thank you to microbes because that's the reason they're so fluffy and yummy yeah nobody wants to make idlis with flat batter right nope i mean 
what is that that's just cake it's not an idli okay so let's move a little now from very yummy microbes microbes that make our food yummy to bad microbes let's talk a little bit about bad stuff also but before that any questions as we transition from good to bad i know it always gets more interesting when you're moving from good to bad right sneha yes <laughs> all right i see some smiles so any questions as we are transitioning okay uh, i can see is cheese another example of microbes in food yes definitely that's a great example cheese is also made delicious by microbes and different types of cheese have different types of microbes and those peculiar smells sometimes that cheese have for example blue cheese has a very peculiar smell sometimes people love it sometimes people hate it but all of that also comes from microorganisms uh and okay. um, very good question by advait is there a difference between microbes and microorganisms no they're just two words for the same thing okay so microbes microorganisms all of this just means organisms that are micro in size correct correct okay so are we ready to take on some bad stuff now yeah we love food athanch that's totally true if this wasn't a virtual platform we would be eating while doing this yes we would talk <laughs> about science over food all the time all right so are we ready let's talk about the bad guys okay so here we're going to talk about two of them one is wound infections which lots of young people would be familiar with because we play we fall we cycle we we are supposed to do all of that and then malaria which is a big problem in india and you'll hear your parents say mosquito dal repellent dal ke jao you know i'm cases of malaria are going up so let's see how all of this is relevant okay so we we'll start with wound yeah. infections go ahead yes yes okay so all of you have heard of the word infection i am pretty sure of that now yes so can anybody give us examples of an infection that you've had maybe you were you got a cold you had a throat infection can anybody think of infections they've seen yes okay i can see lots of people saying yes me so everybody's had infections okay how many of you have fallen sometimes either you were cycling you were playing in the playground you were on a swing yes absolutely lots of yes. people yes it's fine happens to all of us right and then you maybe got a wound somewhere you got hurt maybe there was a little bit of blood um but what did you observe about this wound did it go away or do you still have it well i hope it went away right i hope yes. i hope you are all fine it went away you might have a tiny mark somewhere you have a scar yes but the wound went away right but sometimes for some people they can get infected and infections means that there are microbes present in this site where you've been hurt now when it's a throat infection it means that there are bad microbes in your throat when it's an ear infection it means that there are probably bad microbes in your ear when it's an eye infection sometimes your eyes become red uh, they become swollen that's again because there are some kind of microorganism that has entered a place it should not be okay so infections can be harmful they can make us sick um and there are different types of microorganisms that infect different sites of our body so if we look at the skin this is now putting your skin under a microscope right it's the largest organ of the body if you put it under the microscope what is the one structure that you see here that you can say ah i can identify that you don't need to tell me anything more scientist people because i also can identify that in the skin what is that one structure that you see in this microscopic section of the skin oh, yes kamish it's our hair it's our hair i mean cosmetic or otherwise it's there and so the skin also has many layers and depending on the different layers that are injured when you fall you can call a wound superficial means upper layers deep means lower layers both of them can get infected it's more likely the deeper layers they get infected with microbes and the microbes then show up as pus pain redness the wound is not healing and so we want to prevent all of this one way you do it is by taking first aid when you fall in the playground right okay but let's look at wound infections and then see what we do to prevent them yes okay so normally wounds they happen a small layer or a few layers of your skin get exposed 
usually if there's blood within some time it will stop it will form a clot right then what your body does it recruits immune cells or it recruit it tells your immune system that listen you've been hurt this is the location you need to send all your defense to this location so that we can heal this quickly and usually that's what happens but when you're infected what happens is that there are microorganisms at this site different types of bacteria fungi viruses lots of things can be there and they start to build a home for themselves in your wound okay they make like a nice protective outer layering uh, and they're all secreting different enzymes they're using nutrients at that site to grow and all of this makes it very difficult to treat these wounds so then your immune system cannot attack these bacteria because they've protected themselves by building this outer layering uh and if your immune cells cannot clear that site if they cannot make that site free of microbes it prevents new skin cells from forming there which means that your wound is just stuck there it can't heal it's just getting worse because there are microbes growing in it and so one of the things that you do to treat these infected wounds is try to give antibiotics okay we've all heard of antibiotics and there are multiple other steps that are taken to treat these wounds which we'll look at now right so you would remember falling down and then you know you say ouch maybe a little cry whatever whatever you call it in your home language boo boo ouchy whatever it may be my son is going to be embarrassed now and then the first thing you do is wash it with water then you clean it then maybe you put an antibiotic solution or cream and you try and prevent the infection and these are all things that should be done but in some people the infection persists maybe because their general health is not good for other reasons and then it leads to what you call a wound infection so what an infected wound is basically microbes growing there which we haven't been able to remove with antibiotics and then you have to treat it more aggressively to try and clear that infection all right yes kavish general health means your immune system etc so this is particularly important if you have grandparents living at home who may have diabetes and hypertension aging then aging is normal of course it's not not abnormal but in these cases wounds may take longer to heal okay so any questions before we move to the next bad one next bad one any questions before we move to malaria no questions but adwe okay. says we have lots of chats okay okay we will be talking <laughs> about biofilms next week i saw a few questions on biofilms so biofilms are basically a cluster of different microbes um and we'll talk about what they are and why they're important next week okay so let's then start about malaria yeah let's yeah. move on okay so again malaria is something i'm sure all of you have heard of maybe you know somebody who had malaria maybe you had malaria and hopefully you've recovered from it Okay so what do you think of when you hear the word malaria if you know somebody around you who's had malaria what kind of symptoms did they have does anybody remember i mean definitely fever yes yes kavish is already definitely. naming the pathogen right now like i mean there was ronel ross and then there's kavish <laughs> so that's amazing kavish well done so lots of yes, fever cough fever okay. yes chills yes definitely okay and we've also heard body pain yes we've also heard so when is it that your parents tell you to be careful about malaria is it all the time throughout the year or is there a particular season when you're asked to be more careful can anybody think of what season yes the rainy season right and why is it the monsoons that's because usually there's stagnant water lying around somewhere if you have plants at home you know there might be um, water that's gathered at the bottom uh, or just somewhere near where you live there might be a place where water gets too stagnant and all of this is harmful because it provides a place for malaria to spread more okay and we'll see how it is that they spread but you've all heard of malaria so we're going to now see what causes malaria and why is it that it's particularly in the rainy season why is stagnant water important okay so malaria is caused by a microbe but it's not a bacterium it's not a virus it's not a fungus it is a parasite and you know what's so unique like kavish mentioned it's in the plasmodium family and there are a few different species that are named here but you don't need to get too worried about the complex names what's so unique about plasmodium is that it likes to live inside your red blood cell it's like saying you know 
I want to buy. I I want to buy only a particular kind of apartment. Like I, I you know, it's a very selective, exclusive home that it chooses, which is inside your red blood cells. So if you look at this picture on the left, there are lots of RBCs or red blood cells, and then you have some which have these clusters of parasites in them, and that is just shown through different ways in these other two images. Different stains are given to these cells, and you see the parasite growing in the red blood cells. and it grows it also moves to the liver as we'll talk about the life cycle shortly but this causes all your symptoms so for your fever your chills okay um now why is it so important to know the life cycle and also the rainy season and its association so so i'll we'll talk to you about this yes so we've all been told to be careful from mosquitoes during the rainy season but we just learned right now that it's actually a parasite that causes malaria so why are we trying to be careful from mosquitoes so the reason is because the mosquito is what carries the parasite so the parasite is growing inside water probably somewhere and a mosquito picks it up and when the mosquito bites us it injects um a part or a part from this life cycle of this parasite into our blood stream and eventually this grows inside us it goes and infects our red blood cells and that's how our red blood cells get in, get infected with the parasite so there are two aspects of this one is the parasite is growing on its own outside our body we are it's not affecting us it only affects us when it's transferred to us through the mosquito and once okay. it's in our bodies if another mosquito bites us the mosquito can actually pick up some of the parasite again from our body into it and also go and inject somebody else right so that's, that's also malaria can spread so that's the connection between the rainy season right so in the rainy season not only do will your society start cleaning the wells and tanks in your building they'll also say please don't keep potted plants filled with water have you seen all these signs come up during april may just before the monsoon in india have you seen this guys yes absolutely that is when the mosquito vector it's called a vector the aedes aegypti lays its eggs and uh, these eggs hatch or you know grow in these uh, water bodies cool cool collect cool collections of water and then th there is an increase in mosquito population chances of it transmitting um, transmitting the parasite to humans through the bite also increase where does the mosquito get the parasite from you know from other hosts possibly animal hosts primate hosts and so on okay very good so that is the so so uh, let, let's let's do a recap before we move on malaria is caused by what bacteria virus fungus parasite let's let's type the word what is it bacteria virus very good advert very good very good very good okay a uh, stagnant water allows the growth of what what part of this mosquito life cycle the malaria life cycle the stagnant water very good the parasite mosquito 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 humans get malaria from the humans get malaria from mosquito excellent mosquito okay bite. yes very good very good mosquito bite yes i think we'll move on snail 5 45 yes. ho gaya yes yes okay so how do we treat malaria or can you treat malaria um the good news is that you can there are various types of medicines that are now available um and all of this actually goes back to what we knew from you know literature that we had many 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 decades ago um and this is just to show you how medicines are developed right we first know that there's maybe some particular plant or some particular flower or something that can be used to treat a particular disease uh, we know this from the literature that we have from you know our history our ancestors uh, but because of the advances in science and technology we can now really try to pick out what is the particular molecule in that plant or what is the particular chemical in that plant that helps us treat this disease and this is done for numerous diseases not just malaria and with more and more advances we can make better medicines we can introduce uh, different kinds of medicines and different ways of giving them to patients as well right and okay. so this just shows you a timeline of how fast medicines can be developed with the right technology and how we still need no a basic knowledge that we get from literature that we get from different resources to understand how to treat these diseases 
Absolutely. And um, Snail, I think what we can do is launch the poll now yes. before we go to the ugly part. In the meantime, while Snail is launching the poll, Abhishamath brings a great point that 340 AD, yeah, microbial infections are not new necessarily. There are new infections, but they've existed forever, as long as humans have, possibly earlier. Okay, uh, so let's all do the poll now, guys. This is a quiz, and then we're going to move to the last part of the segment. Go ahead, Snail. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the poll has been launched. You should be able to see it at your end. Again, this is not uh, an exam from school. Okay. So don't get worried or stressed about it. We just want to see if you know your microbes well. And hopefully this will also give you some things to think about when the session is over. Okay. So if all of you can see the poll, please do try and answer the different questions. If you're not sure about anything, it's okay. We yeah, will. have fun. Have fun. Yeah. This is just to give us a little more introduction to microbes. <laughs> okay, and then when we are done with the poll, we are going to talk again about two microbes. So we've talked about the good, which are the yummy ones, and the ones that do good things for our bodies. We've talked about the bad ones that cause infections. Uh, and can make us sick. But now we're going to talk about the ugly microbes. Okay? And they're ugly in the sense of what they cause. They're not ugly to look at. They're actually very pretty. Um, but they're ugly because they can cause really, really big diseases. They can disrupt our lives in crazy ways. And we already know an example of it. And we're going to look at that example a little more in detail. Okay, I can see some of you have already answered. Thank you so much. We'll just wait for a few more minutes for everybody to finish yes, before no. we go ahead. In the meantime, if you finish the poll and you have any kinds of questions for us, please type them in the chat. Uh, if you have questions about Talk to a Scientist, if you want to know anything about like our website, how to sign up, please type them in the chat window and we will answer them. Okay, so 21 of 52 have done it, Sneer. Great. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, Trisha, you should see the poll if you go in Zoom at the bottom and there's a button called Polls. Um, if you click on it, you should be able to see it. Thank you so much, Athansh. Yes, we will try to have more polls in our sessions. Definitely, definitely. Yes, Ishika, we'll see the results shortly. That's why we kind of pushed the poll forward because we can spend some time enjoying the results. We're going to get to the early microbes anyway. We are living through one. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, Shivam has a very good question. Why are TTS session topics mostly biology? <laughs> Uh, Shivam, one reason is because Karishma and I are biologists, so that's where our expertise is. We don't want to try and explain something that we are not experts in, but that's why we have guest scientists. We've had guest scientists come and talk about like black holes, um, astrobiology, astronomy, uh, different kinds of telescopes. So we're trying to bring in people who can, you know, have expertise in other areas, but if you have any suggestions for a topic that you really want to know about, please send us an email and let us know. Okay, Ishika says bio-robotics. Okay, we can try and find someone. Yeah, thank you, Shriya. Caliber guns, okay, uh, okay. Maybe the science behind how you build them. Science behind Bluetooth, how Bluetooth works, makes sense. We've had sessions on marine biology, Neha. You can look it up in our YouTube. Okay. Time travel. Avisha, we are science. We are not yet sci-fi. Okay, birds. AI. Okay, we will definitely try to find somebody on AI. Okay, I think, Snail, we should think of closing the poll. Yes. Five, six minutes. Yes. Hai, huh? hmm. Okay. All right, so I'm going to close the poll now and we can, you should be able to see the results. I hope everybody can see results. Okay, it looks like most of you got a lot of the things right. 
Hmm. So all yes, right. right. Yes. Okay. I can see tons of tons of people have answered, and most of you have got it right. Um, microbes are found everywhere in our body. Absolutely correct. Uh, pathogens are harmful microbes. Um, yes. Microbial process that imparts te taste and texture is fermentation. This is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. So you already know so much about microbes and we hope this session has helped you know more. And now we will move on and yes. look at some ugly microbes. Uh, and what we can do, Snehal, is we can uh, post these questions on the chat window, on the website. My yeah. God, I think now my mind is now blurred between website and Zoom and chat window and everything. Anyway, we'll post it on the website. Okay? Yes, we will definitely do that. Yes, okay. Uh, so, Snehal, we can go ahead. Ugly microbes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, let's start with, we want to talk about two things. One is the Spanish flu. Um which was a pandemic again. And we're going to talk about the ongoing pandemic that we're all living through, which is COVID-19. Okay. So let's start by talking about the Spanish flu or the influenza pandemic. Uh, this was something that happened in the 1900s, uh, specifically in 1918 to 1920. Um, and this was a flu or a pandemic that was caused by a virus again, uh, much like the one we are living through now, but this was a different kind of virus. Um, it was called the avian influenza virus. Uh, this is just a picture or a diagram of what it looks like. It's not a real yes. picture, it's a drawing. Okay, but what you can see is it had an outer layer and it had something inside. So that something inside is its genetic material. It has all the information about how the virus functions, how to make the virus. Okay. And okay, let's we will see what this virus was, how it infected us, and what happened? So it was an inf influenza virus. It came from birds, and therefore it's called avian. It infected humans, and then, you know, underwent changes, much like we are seeing with coronavirus, and caused a massive pandemic over two years. And as you can see in the earlier picture, people were wearing masks then too. This is not new to us, but we also know the solutions, and wearing a mask is one of them. And then if that pandemic wasn't enough, 100 years later almost, we faced another pandemic, which we are all living through and we all know. And it was COVID-19 caused by the novel coronavirus, not the influenza virus, the coronavirus. And we all know a little bit about this, right? Don't we know? We do. Absolutely. So we can move on to... Go ahead, Snehal. Yeah. Okay. So we've all heard about COVID-19. We've all... We're all living through it. Uh, but we just wanted to tell you about how is it exactly that this makes us sick. Or, or what happens. So you've all seen pictures of the co coronavirus on TV, on websites, you've probably read about it in tons of places. And you know that it has this protein on the outside that looks like a spike, right? That's why it's called a spike protein. Um, and it actually uses this protein to enter our cells in our lungs, our nose. So it works like a lock and key mechanism. Okay, so the spike protein is sort of like a key that allows it to enter our cells. And once it enters our cells, it makes more and more copies of the virus. So then there are more and more virus particles in us. Okay, and this causes our body cells to become sick and we can't function properly. And that's how we know that we have been infected. And if you look at it, it has these beautiful spikes, which is like a crown. And therefore it was called Corona or the well, one could say the king of viruses of this century, at least. And, uh, and to understand how these spikes are, if you think of a larger animal with spikes, which is this dinosaur with spikes? Which is this dinosaur with spikes, guys? Oh, look at that, Snehal. They know it all. From microbes to larger-than-life extinct creatures. It was, it is an ankylosaurus. And coronavirus has spikes much like the ankylosaurus. Maybe even nodosaurus has spikes. Who knows? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So like the previous one where we talked about an avian influenza virus, it's very likely that the coronavirus also had a zoonotic origin, which means it came from an animal virus, uh, probably mu acquired some mutations, some changes, so it could infect humans. Okay. And that's how it infected one or few humans. And then it jumped from humans to humans. And that's how we've had so many infections in the last few years. Right. And we've all know how close contact 
or being close to a person who has the virus can transmit it all oh, right and fortunately over two years what we have developed is a range of vaccines so anyone can name the covid vaccines that we know of uh pfizer okay covaxin covaxin covishield all right we all know these names they've been circulating they are dna based mrna based protein based moderna all right exactly and now we are in that phase of the pandemic where we are trying to mitigate it through masks through some level of distancing and through vaccines and it's taken you know a little less than 2 years to get here which is quite remarkable smart thing very good and all these companies that have made it like bharat biotech so excellent guys excellent that's been i don't think they were ugly after all i think it had a very positive spin on how we have dealt with pandemics right right what do you say yes but despite the fact that we have all of these vaccines and we've made so many advances in two years we still need to take precautions we still need to be careful so this is just a reminder for everybody to make sure you wear masks when you go outside make sure you sanitize your hands uh you sanitize common surfaces that you would touch you constantly wash your hands whenever you touch these common surfaces right it's the, these are just small things that we can incorporate in our lifestyle in our daily lives so that we can try to keep us and those around us safe very much very true snail these are very small things exactly. and it can help it can help turn around the pandemic in a few months okay and chika sorry to hear that but and yes. that brings us to the end today so we hope we've shown you that not all microbes are bad there are some that are good there are some that are bad and there are some that are ugly um but hopefully now you won't be scared of microbes you won't think microbes are always bad you will think of the good microbes when you eat yummy food um and you will think of all these important steps that you can take to prevent these ugly microbes from becoming uglier and making our lives worse right and these are steps that you can take you as an individual can actually do something to prevent the spread of these ugly microbes so i think we should all do that i just want to thank shruti and india science festival for getting talk to a scientist on board and letting us be part of the science festival this year thank you.